reconstruction of the foundations of our living together. Two, the rebuilding of institutions. Three, significant reduction in the cost of living to alleviate the burdens of daily life. And then four, national inclusive sectoral consultations on the evaluation and relaunch of public policies. It's also, we've also heard that he plans to uh, change their currency from the SAFA to a Senegalese currency proper and not, uh, you know, continue to rely on France in terms of their monetary affairs. So he's been talking tough. Uh, my guests have already said before even uh, we started the show. So I'll go straight to Kwame Osudan. So I have a few questions on my mind, some questions that I've been asking for the past two days. We know for a fact that Fai, he had the opportunity to contest this election only because Osman Isonko, you know, was in prison. Both of them were in prison, but he came out earlier than Osman Isonko. And it was, I wouldn't say on the benevolence, but it's because of Osman Isonko that, you know, ideally it should have been Osman Isonko in that particular position. So now what comes of Osman Isonko? What is going to be his relevance in this particular administration? Well, thank you very much, uh, Bless. Good morning to you. Good morning to Honorable Inesa Fuseni. Um, it's always a pleasure and a privilege when I uh, sit here as a panelist um, to, sh to share my sense with, uh, with our viewers. Um, you know, when the elections in Senegal uh, was postponed, uh, I think it raised many eyebrows. Many were those who were questioning uh, the democracy of Senegal and whether or not that democracy was going to thrive, particularly because of the unilateral decision that was taken by Macky Sall to postpone the elections without any justifiable reason. And so we were all worried and waiting with bated breath to see the outcomes of the court ruling and the outcomes of, you know, uh, the decision by uh, political actors and players relative to the conduct of the elections. Uh, the court ruled and indicated that the elections must be held and that it was not within the remit of the president to intimate that you know, elections should be postponed, particularly because of the economic outlook and also the political outlay of, of Senegal, it became very imperative that the, the elections were organized so that uh, tempest will calm down and uh, people will begin to go about their normal uh, businesses. You know when it's an election year, uh, there's a lot of agitation, uh, people are concerned, investors are worried, etc. So they needed to get that out of the way so that the economy or the country uh, could still work. I am fascinated, really, and excited at the same time, particularly because we are seeing a new wave of leaders across the continent. Uh, if you look at the countries which have experienced coup d'etats in recent times, a number of the, the, the leaders are very relatively very young, you know, 44, 32, etc. Uh, it, it sends a strong message to me and to the democracy that Africa is experiencing, uh, that perhaps this is the time for the young people to begin to take the mantle of politics, to begin to take the mantle of leadership, and to bring development and prosperity to their people. And clearly, it is a demonstration that we have gotten to a point where all of us must be concerned about the future you know of our countries and and so it's a it's a call to action that we must all be active players you know uh, in politics because politics affects all of us uh, whatever it is that we do you know policies shape businesses and it shapes several other facets of of of, uh, of 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 our economies so clearly i'm very happy about it i mean he's only 44 years he was born in 1980 uh, on the 25th of March, 1980. So he's, he only turned 44 on Sunday, two days after, two, no, I say on Monday, 
two days after my birthday. My birthday was on the 23rd. He is 25th. Uh, so, you know, I'm in happy. After, in the day after the election. Yeah. That, that was a birthday gift for Absolutely, him. Absolutely, that was a yeah. birthday gift for him. But let's look at uh, uh, the man Fee. Uh, yeah. I mean, he uh, was imprisoned because of a post that he made on social media together with his friends Oko. Now, he started his career as a tax man. In fact, he has a, a master's in law. You know, so started his job as a tax inspector together with his friend, um, and so you know they 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 went about their business very well. I think um, they belonged to the disbanded political party. I think it's Pastel or something like that. Um, and you know they, of course, presented a strong opposition to Makisal's government. Uh, so I mean, it was within reach. In terms of, you know, in terms of the fact that they were going to ultimately take control of uh, of the governance of of, of, uh, of Senegal. Now, I would say that his incarceration brought anger rather than excitement amongst the young people, particularly because in Senegal, about 60% of them are under 25 years. And so uh, it, it, it tells you that when the young people, you know, decide that they want their own to lead, it is very possible. So when he came out of prison, uh, he had some endorsements from some political actors and players in Senegal. Uh, and that is what, in my estimation, created the buzz around him, for which reason he gained so much popularity and subsequently won the elections. He won with a staggering 53.7%, uh, and that is quite significant, mm. with the establishment's candidates getting some 39, I believe, percent of the votes. It's quite significant. But it's telling. It's very telling of the fact that people have been unhappy with the way Macky Sall has governed Senegal. People have been ha unhappy with the way their finances have been managed. People have been unhappy with the way Macky Sall has been an appendage of new colonialists. And clearly, they want to do away with that. Indeed, when Faye won, he was very instructive and as eloquent that he was, you know, he stated that now the past must be dissolved. We must forge ahead in unity and his strength. And he was going to govern with humility and with principle, uh, and he was going to be good, you know, in terms of uh, bringing everybody on board to ensure that development is brought to the people of Senegal. I'm particularly excited uh, that in the coming days we will see uh, a young man who will change the narrative and who will change the status quo and who will move the country from where it is now to uh, a better place. Now, you do know that uh, they will start oil and gas production very soon. And so it is, it, 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 you know, the, the victory came at the right time. He, if he conducts himself well, will be able to get enough resources to govern the country. Bear in mind that I think yesterday I was reading somewhere where Faye himself has indicated that he needs France out of Senegal. And he wants to change their currency from CIFA to a Senegalese currency. Uh, this is very instructive. That uh, they no longer want to dine and be uh, subjugated, you know, by France and uh, these new colonial uh, powers. So I'm happy. Um, in the coming days, I'm sure uh, things will unfold clearly. And we'll see the roadmap that he intended to uh, use in order that he can bring development to the people of, of Senegal. But also it tells us that uh, uh, young people in, 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 in Ghana must be up and doing. That if our fellow young people are taking over the helm of affairs in these countries, uh, nothing stops us from also finding ourselves and perhaps, you know, getting more involved in the governance process and finding a seat at the table 
where we'll be able to express ourselves without let or hindrance and where we'll be able to even compete uh, and uh, you know bring some some development to the people ultimately we must ensure that uh, we further enhance the aspirations of the people of, of, of our countries and, and, and it's a clarion call uh, uh, to all of us that we must be involved and bring development to our people. Thank you very much, Honorable Sudan. So, Honorable. Well, I think that it is proper for me to say good morning to you and to lawyer Kwame O. Sudan. So, I like the name when I got called to the bar. Yeah. The change in status, no, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable. Good. And uh, to our numerous viewers in Ghana and across the African continent and beyond. I think Senegal has demonstrated once again that they have a resilient democracy. Mm. Senegal is the only country in Africa that has not experienced a military insurrection. They, uh, they believe, and the military believe, that their role is to protect the territorial integrity of the, gov of the state. And that even in situations where governments are not performing according to the will of the people, the military only advises government about the discontent in the, in the country and how it poses a national security threat to their country. Uh, in fact, uh, as recently as last year, uh, Makisar decided that uh, because of the, what he perceived as the happiness in the country, that did not conduce to uh, democratic elections, he was going to postpone the elections. Pressure mounted both internally and externally on him not to truncate the democratic experiment and experience of the, of the Senegalese people. I mean, the court itself, and, and that is, you see, that's why we need institutions. And that's why uh, Fai's, Fai's statement when he was elected resonates with me. You build resilient institutions. Mm. You don't build regime institutions. Resilient institutions. So institutions that will protect the norms and values of the society in which you live, which believes that they have a rule to, to secure the, the cohesion and total development of the country. Uh, the, the Supreme Court stood up. The Supreme Court of Senegal stood up against uh, uh, Makassar and declared his act as unconstitutional. It gave him a very limited time to organize elections because what was happening in Senegal was that they were teetering on the brink of constitutional crisis because the time of uh, of uh, uh, Makassar was going to expire anyway, and the constitution had only given him some limited time, and he was postponing elections. So what was going to happen if he didn't conduct the elections after after the expiration of his time? So the Supreme Court was very clear said, look, I think that it is in the interest of this country, Senegal, that you conduct elections and don't put us into a constitutional crisis. So he agreed. Before the elections, there was a very famous, popular politician, Usman Sanko, who had been incarcerated on two charges, one of rape and uh, the other of uh, defamation. defamation. And then and because of the incarceration, he had been deprived, disqualified, banned from taking part in the elections. It's important to say that Bashir Ufai was not the obvious choice of the party, the pastel. It was Osman Sonko. Osman Sonko had contested the previous elections. He had also performed very well in the previous elections. He had been very consistent, a very vocal critic of Makisar. Osman Sanko was a friend and that is again it's good that um, Kwame is my friend and brother. I mean friendship goes a long way. I mean they were they were in the same occupation uh, they are tax uh, men uh, they thought that the way their country was being governed was not good uh, they came together and formed a political party uh, to push the ideas of how the Senegal they want, uh, working together with uh, Sonko, uh, 
uh, they have come this far. Now, it's also important to state that uh, apart from the mayoral elections that he contested so many years ago, I mean, 2022, in his home country, I mean, hometown, in Dia Gama or what, the Gambia, uh, Bashir Rufai had never con I mean, taken part in the major content competitive elections. So it's fair to say that the rise of Bashiru from a village boy to a taxman to prison and to president, he ruled largely, especially in the last from prison to president, he ruled largely on the shoulders of Osman Sonko. That's a fact. Yeah. Osman Sonko had already created the architecture for mobilizing the youth. He had already endeared himself to the youth. But when he was being tried, there were random battles with the police in Senegal by the youth. And so clearly, Usman Sonko's mobilizational abilities greatly assisted because fire was little known in Senegal, even though he was part of the party and he was a friend and still a friend of uh, Osman Sonko, but he was little known in the country. A uh, taxman who went diligently about his work, criticizing government when it be found expression in the formation of a political party where he could channel his ideas uh, for the betterment of Senegal. And that was it. Uh, it's good that this has happened. The Senegalese people have demonstrated that they are prepared to defend their democracy. Look at a limited time. Not three months. Not clearly one month even. But they rose up. The rules of they were just released a few let me this a few months ago yeah. and then and they, when they uh, I mean uh, 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 removed the ban on political campaigning and gave seven days for the elections they were able to mobilize the people yeah. and they produce a result in fact again let me comment bar yeah uh, Bukhari uh, worker bar for conceded. for conceded very early in the day when people were saying that something could be done about the elections and all those things and trying to encourage him to hold on until they could see that they, what they could do to manipulate the outcome of the elections he said no the senegalese people has to have spoken and that he was going to respect the manifest will of the senegalese people and so conceded defeat even though even before the publication of the official results and so that is also good for democracy. The key element of democracy is for losing parties to con con lose, losing candidates to defeat. defeat. And, and then winning can candidates to be magnanimous in victory. So uh, it's good that that didn't happen. Uh, again, Sonko is taking politics to new levels. Mm -hmm. Even before the elections, he published his assets and we challenge all the other political parties to do so. So as we speak, everybody knows the access, the access of uh, Sonko. I mean, some people in this country have, have since they assumed office in 2017, never published their assets. <laughs> never declared their assets. They are, they are not, not, not even published, or declared their assets. They have not. Uh, and uh, many people are building marshes. Uh, some were even CEOs who acquired properties, including properties in the Achimota Forest and, 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 and Forest themselves. So clearly, uh, uh, recently we heard that uh, the late John Kuma built a $2 million mansion. I mean, uh, whether that uh, mansion is part of his assets. And when you go around the country, you will find uh, big, big properties, big, magnificent properties in the rumor to be in the, in the properties of. Uh, current political actors. So uh, it's important that uh, we state and put it in context that Songo has demonstrated now, as we speak, that he's coming for the Senegalese people. He's given some life to tra transparency, transparency and accountability. Uh, well, 
He's a 44-year-old man, so he can be idealistic. He's, he's permitted to be so. Uh, he wants to change his country. Uh, people are now wondering what role Osman Sonko will play. And I say, whatever role Osman Sonko will play in the administration of Bashir Ufai, it is important to state that since Bashir Ufai is his protege, he will have a responsibility to assist him to, to succeed. Mm. Very, very important. Because uh, Osman Sanko will definitely be the leader of the party, or he will be given a role in government. Yeah. And, and if whether, whichever role he's given, whether he's as leader of their personal party, or he's given a role in government, uh, it is the collective victory, the collective success of the party that will determine how the people of Senegal will view Usman Sonko and his party. Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, they are starting on a very good note. Uh, uh, congratulations to all the people of Senegal. All the people of Senegal. No one head of ballot box stuff. No one. No one head that it, somebody was killed. Or there was violence. No one. I don't think you heard that. Do you? Mm. Nothing. So the Galician people just went to the polls and elected the one they wanted. This should serve as a lesson to us in Ghana here. We don't need to kill people to be made presidents. We don't need to. And the youth, you don't need to die for anybody. Just insist on your right to vote. Just insist on your right to vote and be vigilant so that your vote can count. No need to send cordials or arms to the police stations. Senegal should teach us that we can achieve what we want to achieve if we turn out in our numbers and votes and when we make sure that our votes count. So, for my NDC party members, let's make sure that we turn out in our numbers and votes and make sure the votes count. That's what the Senegal is teaching us. And not uh, to move around police stations uh, with pistols and cudgels and, uh, and, uh, and catapults uh, 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 and slings uh, to harm others. No, we are one people. We are common destiny. If you want change, the, the, the route to change is to take part in the elections. And, and for people who say, well, we won't vote. Come out and vote. And vote for change. And that is how you ensure that the country remains peaceful. And that the elections will be determined and determined decisively so that there will not be, uh, uh, be grievances or challenges to the outcome, outcome, outcome of the elections. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister for saying you know. Um, we'll proceed to some conversations, but we'll go for a short breather and we'll get into that Supreme Court ruling directing Parliament Anna. to approve uh, the President's ministerial nominees. Do stay. No, I'm not serious. I'm coming. Give me one minute. The law is pertinent to every aspect of our lives, and so lawyers must not be the backup plan for the rainy day only. Nothing received from a client should be put in a lawyer's personal account until such time that the money has actually been earned. It is very dangerous to perpetuate the theory that it is narcotics that leads 
to crime increase. The relevance of the law cuts across our business, social, and family transactions. Doubt this. You can't borrow from somebody who's a, a, your client. That would lead to a conflict situation. And that's something that as a lawyer you must jealously guard when you are representing a client. You have to register your Mohammedan marriage within seven days? Within a week of the celebration of the marriage. So yes. if you don't register it, it's not a valid it's not marriage. Valid. Journey with our Law Express panel every week as we confirm the place of the law in our everyday transactions. Under etiquette rules, a lawyer can terminate for non-payment of fees. So okay. basically, if you don't pay your fees, a lawyer has a right to terminate your engagement. It's also a little bit of a cliche. I mean, we're all used to the what, what the James Bond scene, as it were, with all the ambassadors sipping champagne um, and seeming to do nothing else but dine and sip champagne at receptions. Welcome back to the show. It's still the morning show. Good morning, Africa Live here on Pan African Television. Unfortunately, Kwame had to take leave of us, but I still have Honorable uh, Inusa Fusini here. We are going to be continuing with the conversation. But let me read some of your messages. Um, good morning, Bless. I'm Odro Imano for, from Amamole. Senegal has demonstrated to the rest of African countries Ghanaians should emulate their bravery on 7th December this year by voting massively for John Dramani Mahama and the NDC party. Thank you very much for your message. Good morning, Honorable Alaji Nusa Fuseni. You have always led with respect. We are proud to have learned this quality from you. Thank you for guiding us both professionally and personally from Buhari in Bukurusun. I want to believe I pronounced the name Abukruso, uh, right. Um, this one here says, my name is Tomla from Mankran. So under the Nana Baumia government, is there any state institution in Ghana that's still fair, professional, and unbiased in its function? There's very little or diminishing confidence in these institutions, especially the Supreme Court. It has become highly predictable in what or whose case to call uh, or ignore completely, and the kind of judgment to expect, hence its nickname, the Unanimous FC. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Tom Lamancra. So for that message, let me proceed to this one, uh, which says that uh, did I hear the nation record say that those who say there is doom so are evil? Who are more evil than them? Can they tell us who were behind the overthrow of uh, the Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's government in 1966? Again, who were behind? Who was behind the evil activities at Ayawaso West Wagon and the killing of eight innocent people during the 2020 elections? Asanko from Santa Maria. You can as well send in your messages there. Uh, message line or the text line will be displayed on the screen. Send in via WhatsApp or alternatively, we are streaming live on Facebook. Let us know what you think. Now, away from that, um, the Supreme Court has ruled on uh, Honorable Roxanne Nelson Dapia Mekbo's case, uh, which he took to court. Uh, he sought to bar Parliament from approving some ministerial nominees of Nanado Danko Kufuado. Remember that before Parliament went to recess, the Speaker of Parliament made it clear that they weren't going to approve the ministers until that case has been determined. And I would say the expedition with which the court has, you know, uh, delivered their verdict on this matter is astounding, especially when somebody had actually sent another case to the court. Uh, which sought to bar the president from assenting to the LGBTQIA plus bill. That one has not been determined, but this one, uh, the court has. I'll go straight to Honorable Inusa Fuseini to tell us, um, I'm sure he, he knows, he's read the ruling and uh, what the court has said, but for someone who uh, has been minister, for someone 
who has been member of parliament represented the good people of Tamale Central very well in parliament on I mean for a good number of years I'm sure he knows and has a lot to say about this particular development but honorable let me let me find out from you now in essence the court is telling us that the very fact that the president is reassigning them to other ministries there's no, I mean, there shouldn't be any form of vetting. So if I, if from my layman understanding, and I'm not a lawyer, if for instance, the Minister for Fisheries and Aquaculture, Honorable Madam Hawa Kumsin, the President decides that, look, Hawa Kumsin, I want you to move from this ministry. I want, you, I want to take you to the Ministry of Finance. Then it, then it means that, based on the fact that there was already a vetting, how Akumsin does not need to be vetted again for that ministerial portfolio. How would we be able to evaluate her competence in manning that very sensitive portfolio? Hey, bless. But who says that we are looking for, in vetting ministers, they are looking for their competence? What? What? So... so <laughs> <laughs> so, what are they looking for? Because I'm lost. They're just looking to see whether he definitely is otherwise qualified in terms of the Constitution. Okay. That's what they're looking for. Okay. Uh, but there are, uh, there are nuances. Uh, because it's a public event, mm -hmm. uh, people will then form opinion whether that person who is being sent to the uh, 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 ministry is really fit and proper. It's a fit and proper person to go to a ministry. Mm -hmm. That is for the court of, court of public opinion to make that determination of whether the government actually is living up to the expectation of the people of Ghana in these appointments. Mm. And, and, and also, uh, it's a political question. Mm. Whether having, this, I mean, uh, having nominated a person for parliamentary, prior parliamentary approval and the person having performed so disastrously in the vetted, whether the president will, will recall that person, will revoke the appointment. So th these are the issues. But you don't go to vetted based on your competence. Right. You don't know, you don't you don't do that. You go to to satisfy the constitutional provision uh, which says that you must otherwise be qualified to be a member of parliament. Mm -hmm. So that there's a qualification criteria. Is that person a satisfied bankrupt? Is that person uh, a lunatic? Mm -hmm. I mean uh, whether there is a, a medical report that shows that that person has so problem upstairs and all those things. So these are the these are the issues. Now, for let's come back to the Fiamma the Honorable Nelson Roxon Nelson Eche, the Fiamma Kwa. Roxon had gone to court, and we're all here when the Dakufado said he had done his major reshuffle in seven years, in which he listed three categories of uh, ministers and, and actions. First, ministers who were in the government, uh, who were relieved of their responsibilities. And second, appointments of ministers who were never in government, but who were appointed. Thirdly, he also appointed deputy ministers. The issue that the fear of course sent to court was an issue of whether semantics it's an issue of semantics. Because the general prevailing practice and convention in Parliament and in our democracy is that where a person has been vetted and, and approved by Parliament to be a Minister of State, that person, when the President is reassigned him or her to another ministry, did not go to vetted. This is different from the GH Mesa case where after the infliction, after the expiration of uh, the tenure of office, and because the tenure of office of a president is four years. It's four years, not eight years, four years. Now, so when the president exhausts his four years and is re-elected, that is a new government. So even if you were a minister in the previous government, you have to go through vetting. But within the four years of the president's tenure of office, if you are a minister and the president is reassigning you, you don't have to go through that. 
So that's, that's the difference. Now, the problem with the appointment process, and uh, I say I bring it down to semantics, and the form, the form of the letter, not the substance, the form. Now, the president has said that he was relieving the first category of ministers. He was relieving them of their post. He has said so clearly. And when he listed them, he proceeded to list the ministers. And at the end of the list, he says he is thanking them for their services to the nation. They are wishing them well in their new endeavors. So it appears to the few of a bit of us, that that is the closing of a chapter. OK? And you can't reopen that closed chapter unless you go through some motions. Now, if you are going to, if you then say that that person who was listed in A is not being sent from the Minister of Information to Minister of Works and Housing, the, the film of course rightfully argues that that's, that's a new appointment. Now, and so these ministers, and this is, let's get also the matters straight. These ministers who were affected by the section A of the president's letter and were reassigned are, are not being vetted. They are not being vetted. It's only the new ministers who had never held any position and deputy ministers who have been elevated who are being vetted. Now, because you are vetted as a deputy minister, and you are now being elevated to a minister, you must be vetted. Now, the the view of what he went to court, he also coupled this application with an interlocutory injunction restraining parliament from continuing with the vetting. And it was this, the basis of the claim of false plea in parliament that the speaker Buckman decided that he was going to agenda parliament to the day. He was going to truncate the vetting processes and agenda parliament to the day. Now, why did Mr. Buckman take that decision? Because the writ of service and the of uh, of uh, the federal court and the state of the case had been filed long before that day that we're going to be in that pronouncement. Uh, when I, when uh, the speaker was seized with the information that there was a pending writ at the Supreme Court or not, I'm unable to tell. But I know that it was filed before. Now, and that's why I've had occasion to say that what Buckman did on the day that he adjourned Parliament City Day and truncated the whole processes, including uh, tax uh, waivers that were built and tabled for, to be taken by Parliament, was just to demonstrate the absurdity of the President's Secretary's letter directed at the clerk of Parliament not to transmit a bill passed by Parliament. Bagman has taken issue with Nana and the Kufa, who the president always acted in the way as to in the way as to undermine the constitution. In Ghana, we are practicing a democracy. Our democracy is a constitutional democracy. So it is the constitution that grants the various arms of government power. And they must exercise that power in accordance with the Constitution. Now, Bagman feels, and I, was, I, I have great sympathy for him, and I was struck by the clarity of the statement that he made prior to the adjournment of Parliament in the day, and the importance of the issues raised in that statement. I mean, the merit of the logic of Bagwit that they cannot be faulted. And so uh, he's taken umbrages, he's never happy, he's quite concerned that the president has any time he feels he deems fit 
acts in the way as to undermine the constitution of the Republic of Ghana, particularly to treat Parliament contemptuously. You remember on the eve of uh, the the first the this report this eighth parliament. Mm -hmm. So just were said to yeah. today Bosnaru, both Bosnaru and Donald Trump are facing prosecutions in their home countries for attacking parliament or in the case of the United States Congress. Because it is totally unacceptable for the executive to move the military to parliament. That's an insurrection. And that's not acceptable in a democracy. Now, up to now, no one has been held culpable for that hideous act. But that act sought to undermine parliament in the eyes of writing men. Who be you? I mean, like they said in the, this normal say crew English. Who are you to send people, the military, into parliament? Who are you? But Nana Kovado has not demonstrated anything. Now, you also remember the witchcraft bill and other bills that were passed uh, uh, by Parliament, which were largely private members bills. Nana uh, Kofadu has said that those bills are unconstitutional. The Speaker has taken a bridge again. He says, look, it doesn't, doesn't lie with you as President. It doesn't lie with you to pronounce on the constitutionality or otherwise. Of bills passed by parliament. It is not your job. Sign them and let anybody go to court to challenge their constitutionality. But it doesn't lie with you. If you sign them, provide reasons why you will sign them. But you cannot keep the bills and say, oh, they are unconstitutional. And that's why you have not signed them. So Bangwin again has not been happy. And the president is fond of, and, and, and that, that is that was quite manifest in the letter that they wrote. He got his executive secretary to write. So the the last straw, as is always said, that broke the camel's back was that letter that I refer, referred to, where the president instructed his executive secretary to write to parliament, the clerk of parliament to cease and desist. The language was not only inflammatory, it was also annoying. The parliament was, parliament was terribly annoyed. They thought that this was the height of contempt of parliament. And Bagwe rallied the members of parliament to stand with parliament to deal with a, a bullying president. It appeared to him that the, the presidency was bullying parliament. And he needed the combined forces of parliament to stand up to a bully like the president. And so, but to show clearly that parliament too had power, parliament had to shake that power before the president. And parliament shook a little of that power by saying, demonstrated that it will, it will continue with what it was doing. And that's, that's, and, and that, that now today we are in the, uh, we are in the, a still bit sort of situation, a situation where the president is not signed, parliament is not convened. So, the attorney general yesterday, I listened to him, said that, well, parliament was wrong in, say that they will continue with the, that they have held the job of the Republic. They have held the job of Ghana, and so uh, held it back. And so when the Femme Hall filed his application for an interim injunction, restraining Parliament from go continuing with the veteran of the ministers, uh, he applied to court for a abridgment of time to have that application heard. Uh, it is within his right to do so. 
but raises a moral issue. The reason why we are where we are is precisely because it is the Adelie General who advised the presidency to hold on to the side of the uh, what is it, human sexual uh, uh, rights and family values bill, a proper family values bill, and that has brought us to where we are. Okay, now and the uh, the reason why the reason that Tony Jira gave for not for advising the president not to sign the bill was because two persons, one Dr. Otu and uh, Richard Sky, had filed uh, 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 processes in court to restrain Parliament from transmitting the bill and also to, to prohibit the president from signing assent to the bill. Now, I thought that these matters were very, very important. Uh, Jimmy to test the constitutional power or authority of the president or parliament. I thought it was, I mean, if you want to advance the uh, uh, constitutional jurisprudence of, of Ghana, these actions ought to be, uh, as, I mean, the hearing of these actions ought to be expedited so that, I mean, we will know clearly whether a private citizen can go to court to restrain the president from assenting to bills, or a private citizen can go to court to pray the court to restrain parliament from transmit, transmitting the bill. It's, and and, and what we do, it, it enriches our jurisprudence, our understanding of the law, and particularly the constitution. In the, in the, for the attorney general, it is the, the fear of course action which is exciting to him. <laughs> he decided to uh, apply for abridgment of time to go and hear the film of course case and not uh, uh, Richard Sky's case. Me as it may, what I heard the court say, say yesterday was that the power of the president to appoint is unfettered. Okay, so the president can appoint. And so they will not uh, restrain parliament from continuing with the vetting. But they didn't issue a consequential order, a parliament to resume to continue with the vetting. They didn't issue that consequential order. So it is for parliament now. It comes back to parliament. Parliament has got what we call a legislative agenda. At the beginning of the year, parliament will publish the agenda where it will sit, the first sitting, the second sitting, and the third sitting. That's a legislative agenda. What they will do in the various cities. If there is a state of the address to me, if there's a budget presentation, that's the agenda. So everybody knows that when budget, when a parliament convenes at this time, it will rise at this time. So if you have business to do, especially the executive, you must do it within the time limited by the legislative agenda. So parliament was already scheduled to rise on the day that Speaker Magwood adjourned the House in the day. It is not because of the fear of war. Parliament was going to rise that day. Irrespective, Irrespective of whether there was a, a writ of service or not in court. Parliament was going to rise that day. Now, uh, Parliament will come back somewhere in April. Okay? Now, if Parliament comes back in April, it will be for the Speaker to determine whether or not to continue with the veteran. Okay. I wanted, I, wanted, I wanted to ask if the court's ruling now compels the speaker to um, allow, I mean, to continue the vetting and allow uh, parliament to approve these ministerial nominees. If the, if the court's ruling actually would, has to compel him no, 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 to no, take no, that no, decision. That's what I'm saying, that there's no constitutional order. Mm. There's no compulsion. Mm. The court was minded to limit its pronouncements to the constitutional authority of the president to appoint, and not parliament. Mm. So he said that the firm of all could not come to court to challenge the power of the president to appoint. 
But that's the interlocutory matter. They, mm -hmm. they will still go back and argue the substantive case. Now, so, and the court did not make an order compelling parliament to convert. Now, I listened to the attorney general who said, oh, parliament must just go back and complete the work that they were doing. I say that attorney general, sometimes when he makes statements with the greatest respect to him, they are as useless as a used toilet, toilet paper. No one, not even the president, can compel parliament to do convey. No. And that's why the Supreme Court did not do that. That's why they didn't really do that. Because the only way parliament can reconvince is by their legislative agenda and when the speaker calls them, okay, to the parliament is resuming, is reconvened. Or when there is, under, under special circumstances, when one third of members of parliament sign a petition coupled with an agenda, demanding that the speaker recalls parliament on the basis of that agenda. Then the speaker will recall parliament, and when parliament is recalled, they debate that agenda. They debate the basis of, for the call and whether that agenda is necessary for the, the parliament to be recalled at all. Okay? If they come to the conclusion that that agenda is necessary, the parliament is recalled for a short period of time, and they go back. But no one, according to the standard orders and the constitution, not the Attorney General, not the President of the country, can compel Parliament to do so. Parliament is an independent arm of government, and it's of equal importance. It's a co-equal of the executive and the judiciary. And so there's no lesser arm within the three arms of government. They are like a tripod. Mm. They balance. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, so that is what happened in Parliament. And so for me, Nothing has changed. Parliament is on recess. They are not going to come back until their time. Or, like I said, if there is a petition invoking the uh, uh, the members' right to recall Parliament by signatures of no less than one third of members of the House, or if Parliament in his own wisdom decides to recall Parliament. But as we sit now, the status quo ante prevails. What we have known, the the a German or Parliament City Day is what prevails now. Mm. What, what would take Parliament to approve uh, the ministerial nominees? Is it the Speaker? It, 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 does that decision solely lie with the Speaker? Or uh, the House generally would have to come to a consensus that, look, it is high time we did this. So, I mean, maybe they move a motion and then it's supported and then uh, the the ministerial nominees are so approved. approval are normally unanimous or by consensus okay okay unanimous so everybody agrees consensus a majority of them agree okay so where they disagree where they disagree and then there's a division at the committee level that division is repeated on the floor of the house the speaker doesn't take the speaker is a presiding officer of parliament. He doesn't take part in the debate. He has nothing to do with the approval processes. But he ensures that the dignity and sanctity of parliament is maintained mm. and protected. And so for him, he gives vent to the standard orders and the constitution and the conventions and traditions of parliament. Okay? When he is presided, you can't misbehave. Or the speaker's government will come down heavily on you. Mm. If the speaker, and he is the head of parliament, just like the president is the head of the executive, executive. and the chief justice is the head of the judiciary, the speaker is the head of parliament. So if the speaker decides that, well, uh, in view of what has happened, I think that let's recall parliament, he recalls parliament for parliament, members of parliament to debate. The report produced by the committee established for the purposes of vetted ministers and take a decision on whether to approve of the ministers or not. It is not a speaker. Uh, but I don't want to preempt what can, hap what, what can happen in Parliament. Because mm. as, we, as we speak to, today, Parliament is in the flux. You know the AGC MP yeah. is dead. Yeah. The proper configuration of parliament now is 137 members of parliament for the NDC, 
136 members of parliament for the MPP and one independent candidate. candidate. That's the configuration of parliament. And approvals are by simple majority. So anything can happen. Right. Then we have a former chief taxi minister who is very unwell, my good friend and colleague. Yeah. So anything can happen. Mm. Anything can happen. Mm. Mm. Interesting. I mean, interesting times ahead. Um, I'm looking, I'm particularly looking for the reconvention of parliament and then to see uh, what would happen, especially with the standoff between, you know, the legislative arm of government and then the executive. Yeah, the standoff was totally needless. Totally needless. And, uh, like I have said, and my, the viewers will f forgive me if I'm bringing a lot of constitutional matters into this discussion today. We are learning. So. That, that, because that is, my, that is the area yeah. that I like yeah. and I, in, in law. It's needless because I, I've said elsewhere that our constitutions from 1957 to date are backed by history. So 1957 it was almost an order in council. We didn't sit down to draft our constitution. So they gave it to us. In 1960, we became a republic. So we cut ties with the British. Yeah. So we couldn't do, we could no longer have a prime minister and the head of head of state be the the governor. Yeah. So we 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 propagated the presidential system of government, the presidential constitution of that system. By that constitution, we didn't have a vice president. So we had a, a just like the queen doesn't have a vice queen. Yeah. So we cast a kurma in the mold of a monarch. Then there was a coup. The that is a sixth coup. The way we had opportunity to do another constitution. We did the 1969 constitution. And in the 1969 constitution, we decided that we had had enough of the presidential system of government. And that it didn't secure our Bill of Rights. And that uh, uh, we needed a Westminster system of government. Where to be, a, uh, to be the head of government, you needed to be a prime. I mean, you needed to win the mandate of the people at the constituency level. Like it's in Britain. So uh, we came with the a uh, 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 Westminster uh, type of government and uh, Buzia emerged as Prime Minister uh, and so the the 1969 Republican Constitution was the Prime Ministerial System of Government. Then it relax. It relax. The Kutu uh, Achapo overthrew that Constitution. Yeah, after a long uh, 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 a journey in the world, uh, we came back. We retraced our steps to the to constitutional democracy. And this time we said, oh, again, it looks like the 1969 constitution has not helped us. So <laughs> let's try the American system. We, we've got the British. It has not helped. Uh, let's try the American system. So the 1979 constitution was strictly American. Mm -hmm. Strictly. So it was rigid. It, it is the United States the Constitution that introduced vetted prior approval of Parliament. Because you couldn't be a, a, a minister if you were not a member of Parliament. I mean, you couldn't be a minister if you were a member of Parliament. You, if you were nominated by government to be a minister, then you had to resign your position as member of parliament. Strict separation of powers. It didn't really help us. Because there were issues of protocol. Even a minister and an MP met at the function who had the pride of place. There were there were also there were also problems of uh, 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 the uh, the uh, the budget of Liban, that was the time of Liban, not going through, not receiving parliamentary approval because members of parliament did not see what was in their budget 
for their various constituencies. Mm -hmm. And they felt that they were those who canvassed the votes for the president. So the 1979 constitution took the run last. Then we had the opportunity again after uh, being the wilderness for some time to go back to constitutional democracy. And this time we said, okay, so we've got the British in 1969, we've got the American in 1979. In 1992, let's combine the two. So that's what we have now. So we've combined the two experiences. And that is found in Article 78.1 70, of the Constitution, where the president can appoint ministers of state from parliament with prior approval. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's wh where we are now. Mm -hmm. Now, having brought this constitution, we have also said that, so it's a flexible, it's not a rigid, it's a flexible constitution. constitution. Okay? The doctrine, the doctrine of separation of powers is quite flexible in our constitution. Now, but the constitution has given the various hours of government power to act within the constitution. It has placed some checks on those on the exercise of those powers. Those checks can be substantive, substantive checks. Parliament shall have no power to pass a retroactive legislation. Substantive. You can, Parliament cannot do it. So ours is not the our constitution, Parliament is not sovereign. I mean, Parliament is not supreme. Mm -hmm. It's a sovereign parliament of government. Yeah. Now, so the then executive, you can appoint ministers. You can appoint ministers of state, but in appointing ministers of state, you can only do that with prior approval of parliament. So it's an institutional, it's an institutional limitation on the essence of power of appointment, the power of appointment by the president. And, 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 and uh, the power of the Supreme Court, Article 125, to interpret, uh, to interpret uh, 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 the Constitution and also to hold acts of parliament, uh, acts, uh, acts passed by parliament or acts of the country uh, uh, unconstitutional, is limited only to acts, acts and not to bills. Okay? Or, or to, uh, uh, the conduct of, of of parliament. If parliament is doing doing something which is which doesn't follow the procedure spelled out in the constitution, uh, we, we call we call the process default. Then the you can go to court and say, well, what what parliament is doing is not backed by the constitution, okay? Or the constitution frowns upon it, or it infringes certain provisions in the constitution. So, to what else if you? The Nana Adonoka Kufadu's uh, behavior is not, is not as a uh, receiver, is not receiving the bill that was transmitted to him by parliament. is so unconstitutional that it's not funny. Because Article 1067 of the Constitution does not appear to be not to create a situation of rejection or a rejection of the transmission. Rejection of the transmission. Let's get it clear. It presumes that the 1067 presumes that where the bill is trans a bill passed by parliament is transmitted or presented to the speak the, to the president, the president will accept same. That's a presumption. And I'm yet to hear anybody give me a contrary provision of the bill that rebuts that a presumption. Now, but in 1067, a careful reading of that, of that provision will tell you that the president has got a veto power. There's a veto power there. It who says that, look, when the bill is transmitted to the president, he has seven days within which to assert to it or refuse to assert. Seven days. That's where the veto power. So the president can veto. And I've said, it, I've said that it appears again on careful reading of the Constitution that this Constitution had anticipated the situation in which we are. 
So it's a forward-looking constitution. So why does the constitution give timelines? Why did the constitution not say, simply say that, well, where a bill is presented to, have it been passed by parliament, where a bill is presented to the speaker, uh, to, to the president, he has to assert. The, the president shall assert. Because the constitution knows. And the drafters of the constitution were of the view that a bill could contain clauses which have been passed by parliament, which will not find favor with the president. So it's a forward looking constitution. So the, uh, the bill is said to uh, the presidency under Article 106, 7. The president has got seven days to assent or not to assent. Where the president refuses to assent, 106, 8, he has 14 days. And again, constitutional lawyers will ask, why are they tab lines? Why are they tab lines? Why are they tab lines? So that you don't frustrate parliament. You don't frustrate the people. And parliament is the people. All of us ought to have been sitting in parliament. But there is no edifice that could contain all able adult men and women to sit down and think, and how will you even... Over, over 30 million of us. How will you even, <laughs> <laughs> how even, even regulate the... Yeah. But, so that's why we have delegated that responsibility to a few of us yeah. to go there. So how will the people, how can you treat the people who contempt? That's why the, the Constitution gives timelines. Seven days, 14 days. The 14 days, if you decide not, if the president decides not to assent, he says a memo to parliament, memoranda to parliament, indicating the provision that he's not happy with in the, in the, in the bill. That clause that he's not happy with. Suggesting amendments or making recommendations. Right. Or the president can simply say, oh, because of the nature of the bill and the its importance and the issues that the bill's, bill is raising, I referred, say, to the Council of State under Article 90. You can say that in, in, in Article 1078, in the memo that he sent to Parliament. Mm. And when the bill is referred to uh, uh, the uh, Council of State under Article 90, the Council of State has 30 days. So 7, 14, 30 days. When you read all the bills together and everything, the provisions together, I'm left in no doubt that the president has defaulted in the performance of his duties in this country. Mm. And his default undermines the purpose and intent of those provisions indicated therein. And the combined effect of the conduct of the president is the undermining of the constitution and the treating with contempt of the August House of Parliament. Mm. Right, thank you very much, Honorable Yunus Afusini. Let me read a few of your messages. Good morning, bless. I'm Dominic from Bogatanga, uh, Tongo. I just want the youth of Ghana to be mindful of uh, desisting any violence come, come December 7, 2024 elections because there's no need for you to die for someone to win political power. Be wise. Thank you very much for your message. Uh, as we enter the death of Jesus tomorrow, may we have a renewed sense of patriotism and work hard to make Ghana a better place for us all. Ghana shall surely rise again. Kwisiri notes uh, in Agona or Dobeng. Thank you so much for your message. Good morning. Bless. I want my honorable former MP to help to understand the power of the Supreme Court vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the functions of Parliament. Can the Supreme Court instruct Parliament to approve the ministers, particularly when the substantive issue had not been dealt with? Joe from Tadi. Good morning. I want the learned lawyer to educate us on the probable cause for the non-resolution of the case filed against the E-Levy Act, which is still at the Supreme Court. Uh, right? Thank you so much for your, mes uh, for your message. This one here says, good morning, bless, and your panel for the good work you are doing for Mother Ghana. I'm highly disappointed in the Supreme Court's unprofessional conduct for throwing out the suit filed by Honorable Dafia Mekwo. May I know when the Supreme Court will throw the suit filed by uh, 
Mr. Susu and so preventing the president not to sign the LGBTQ plus bill into law. Thanks from Aze in Manhattan. Thank you so much for your message. Um, Kwablavi of Pukwase says that Energy Minister Napu must be sacked over the rampant light of and arrogance. Even here, right now, as I speak to you, as you are watching me on your screens, <laughs> the lights are off. Except that we have a UPS that has ensured that is ensuring that you can still watch us right now, right now. Just some few seconds, some ten seconds ago, they've, they've they, I mean, they've taken uh, off the light. It means that we'd have to rely on our plants. Hmm. Right. Let me do some more messages. Uh, this one here says. Good morning, my brother. You see now Supreme Court is uh, the agent of the MPP because this uh, LGBTQ plus has been in court for two weeks before Nelson Dafia was sent his kids to court, but they quickly dealt with this and left the main issue. Please, Ghanaians are watching the MPP closely. Uh, Kluche Jacob from Amfoy Gang Hospital in the Volta region sent this one. Uh, Mano James says, the incompetence of Kufado is not enough, but kakistocracy of the MPP government has made Ghana poorer. Uh, our democracy and laws in the constitution are not effective because the president and the judiciary are the cause of it all. Uh, Odikro Nana Kobnata says this country seriously needs resetting. We need to say goodbye to the NDC and NPP for the next 16 years and replace them with a government of national unity that would harness the finest minds and talents of the country for the development of the country. Maurice Serulo says, bless, good morning. Is the court of the land also a puppet of the Nana People's Party? Uh, Yemi Lawal says, uh, Nigeria is next in line to have a, a young leader after Senegal. He goes on to say that France wants to install puppets in its former uh, colonies, but they will surely fail because the spirit of Sekuture, Kwame Nkrumah, and Thomas Sankara will always live in the minds uh, and hearts of the people. Africa must be free. Samuel Chidubem is watching us all the way from Nigeria. Thank you so much for doing that watching. Right, now we'll quickly uh, run through our final topic. Our final topic for conversation this morning has got to do with uh, the Vice President's comments uh, to the Ghana Revenue Authority. And he says uh, they, are, they, I mean, they set unrealistic targets for themselves and harass traders. Traders have come out to say that, yes, it is true. Uh, the GRA officers actually do harass them. What some of the traders may not know is that they do not set the targets for themselves. Government actually sets the target for them. And so they have no other option than to employ these uh, means, whether by hook or by force, to actually get the attacks. Now, the, the vice president has said that when he wins power, he's going to grant tax amnesty uh, to these people. But the JR actually responded in a press statement um, chiding the vice president for the comments he made and they are asking him to not even talk about those issues at all if he doesn't have ample knowledge you know on them and this is a man who actually heads the economic management team honorable <laughs> well the vice president uh, of late has run into great obstacles and these great obstacles uh, have been created by him because he presented to the people of Ghana a larger than life vice president. He carried himself uh, in this country uh, to suggest that there was a co presidency yeah. uh, of the Nana Ado, Nana Kakufado, his government. Uh, indeed, many a times you heard the vice president make statements and make promises to suggest that he had the authority and capacity aside the dad of to implement those uh, uh, promises or fulfill those statements that he was making. And so uh, the people of Ghana, and, and he made them so forcefully yeah. that the people of Ghana believed in him. Now, so the people of Ghana are left greatly disappointed in the turn of events that 
This man who spoke so eloquently and so forcefully to hook us into giving him his party power is not coming back to us with a new set of promises. <laughs> and, 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 and that is, the, that is the, pro the problem. I have said, and let me say it again. You see, Bobia is taking all of us for fools. Because no one has ever promoted a failed student. No one. How do you promote a failed person? You are vice president. The country has failed. The country is now in doldrums. Your administration has achieved the dubious title of the most useless government in the history of this country. You and the pre president have been described as being reckless spenders of the public purse. Now, you are somebody whose wife, and the vice president, whose wife was so confident in your abilities to transform the economy that she was upon the time said that you, Baumia, have the combined brains of the IMF and the World Bank. The, the combined brains bring us to uh, junk status. The combined brains uh, uh, give us an inflation of 51%, a 54.1%, and now over around, <laughs> around 20, 24%. The, the combined brains has uh, affected the dollar. Uh, since the dollar broke loose from the from jail, consequent upon the arrest by Bobia in 2017, thereabouts, and the do dollar broke jail, the dollar has been running wild. Today it's around uh, 14 cities per dollar. I mean, and this is a man who when they were in the position, had set a very high standard for John Draman and Mahama. I mean, uh, they had said that what John Draman and Mahama was doing uh, did not meet our expectation. And, and so they, and they, 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 they were not appreciative of what uh, difficulties we were going through, and that John Draman and Mahama's uh, uh, administration was an incompetent administration. And so the the because they set a higher standard for him, and the other man was not meeting that standard, uh, they, they told people, the people of Ghana that they could do better. Now you come into office, you are not even you have not even met that standard. Then you describe your mama as being equal. You have not even got there. Let the Lord reach the highest standard that, that you set for him. And then you now come to us that we should, award, uh, we should reward you, we should promote you. We should promote you to presidency, for vice president. Oh no. Uh, to be bonkers. We will bonkers if we do that. Because ah, it's silly. Because you have not been able to do that. You have not been able to do the things that you said you will do. You have not even gotten to the point where uh, you said that the man who was in charge then was not doing well. And you are saying that we should elevate you in view of all these failures. We should elevate you. But a desperate man does desperate things. So Bobby is a desperate man who wants to be president of the country. And he's measures. Measures. <laughs> so he goes to as he, he goes to the GRE and talks down for GRE. Talks down. Now the government and the ministers knew what he was doing was wrong. That's why the finance minister quickly came back and said, well, I'm not here to talk down on you. I'm here to commend you. You, you, saw, the, you saw the first person. I'm here to commend you. Because my records show that last year, you did 95% of your target. 95% is not a condemnable achievement. So again, a student of politics, as a student of politics, you put that, what the finance minister said, against what the vice president said, then you will find that the center is not what? It's a whole different. There's something fundamentally wrong. Now, 
Then the workers come to say, no, 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 we are so disappointed in Bobia. We are so disappointed that you come to us and talk the way you have spoken to, to us. Because we don't set our targets. We don't set our targets. You set the targets. Government sets the targets for us. So we know the business uh, uh, entities that exist. We know what goods come into the ports. So we collect those taxes and pay them into the consolidated fund for the use of government. If we are not able to do that, we are condemned. We are not, I mean, we are condemned. And so if we do that, if we are able to go and to be able to, and no one walks to a tax office to pay tax. If not, Jesus himself would not have said, give to Caesar, Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Because the people who were not, who were not paid, they were tax dodgers. They were tax dodgers. Even he knows this. So we had to take the intervention of Jesus Christ, alayhi salam, say, no, give to Caesar. What belongs to Caesar? Well, what was, was he talking about? Tax. Pay your tax to Caesar. Pay tax. People, people don't want to pay tax. And also, give to God the tithes. What belongs to God? So pay. And the tax man, ah, don't you see that the tax, tax offices are nearer the businesses? So that while you are there in your office doing your business, they are watching over you. And they know what comes in, how many tax comes in, and what Whether you are keeping the records or not, they are able to tell. And, and, and Ghana, we've gone, I mean, the Bible says, it recently was a student, it says part of his achievement is that when we say he has failed, he has not failed because he has brought digitalization. But the gift makes a world that were in place before. The paperless port was in place before Bobby and Co came in. Now we have been able to create these platforms to serve as buffers to know how businesses are doing. Now it is no longer possible for a businessman to just sit at home and say, oh, this year I didn't do business. Because the entries at the port are recorded. The tax liabilities are recorded. And everything that you do, the sales are recorded. VAT receipts are, they are all pointers to whether the company is doing well or not doing well. So, uh, when Bobby says, well, you are harassing taxmen, he was speaking for the position of ignorance. Moreover, taxes are not paid in advance. The quarterly payment of taxes is not in advance. It's an arrears. Do you know what the what it describes as harassment? The government for a very long time, and it started during Professor Milson's time, decided that wait, why, why do you have to wait until the end of the year? To go and be because they were taking take the money to some places. So why do them a quarterly basis. Okay, every three three months, uh, go to them, uh, assess their tax, what they have done within the three months, and do what? And let them pay up. So that you don't wait until it accumulates and then they can't, they can't pay and they become tax dodgers. But we are saying, so uh, you are harassing them. I don't know who is harassing them. The one who sets the targets or the one who collects. Who harasses who? Now, but the most important thing is the statement he made to be a businessman. Granted tax and amnesty. Do you know that we have it already in place? You know, it's the law. It's the law in Ghana. That if you can't pay, and there is demonstrable reason to show that you can't pay, the government will grant you an amnesty. The why most countries that have listened to tax, uh, tax experts speak on this, why Bobius uh, 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 promise to, to grant tax amnesty on the whole, whole scale basis, whole, wholesale basis, not even in the accordance with the law, whole, 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 wholesale business. Because he says, 
and we will start afresh, and we will start afresh. <laughs> why, why it's dangerous is that some people genuinely look at pain. The Lord recognizes that. And so they did intervention. And because they can't pay, the intervention is for you to give them an amnesty. Now, some people too are doing well. And there are equity issues. How do you treat those who can't pay? How do you treat those who can't pay like those who can't pay? How equi equitable is that? Two, how do you distinguish between those who can pay but are unwilling to pay against those who, are, who can pay and are paying? These are issues, tax issues. And so that is why his proposal is so dangerous that even though they have already made the economic kotos, kobatos, what they are trying to do now, what Bobby is trying to do now, is that if granted an opportunity, if we are so silly as to promote him to be president, he will just kill the, <laughs> he just kill the economy. <laughs> then, apart from that, even today as we speak, even today as we speak, you are still negotiating with your debtors. And the IMF program is going to run until 2025. And you are still negotiating with your debtors. When you start paying, if your debtors agree that you should not pay, they, 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 they receive the haircut. You will definitely pay. So what, they are, they, they, what you are negotiating now is an amnesty, sort of. But you will still pay. You still pay. Now, and what are you going to use to pay? The bauxite that you went and treated as butter for the Chinese sort of hydro load, or what? What are you going to use to pay? Is that not the same taxes that you're going to use to pay? Then you say that, oh, uh, I'm going to grant you tax amnesty. So we don't pay. We are going to start afresh, afresh. That afresh time, there will not be money that the country will legitimately have to be able to service their yeah. debts. So I think that even the importers and exporters association of Ghana have seen through the deception and are calling Bobia out. That well, they remind him of having told them so many years ago that if granted the mandate, his government the government of Rana Kufadu and Bobia will move this country from, from taxation, taxation to production. To production. Right. They are yet to see it. Mm. Yeah, they reminded him. Mm. And today, there are about, there are rough, rough of taxes that have been imposed on the people of Ghana to pay, including double taxation, pollution levy, and emissions levy. Emissions levy, yeah. To clearly, uh, they are not a, a, a two. So, I think that all of us must call Bobia out. But most importantly, most importantly, no teacher and no group of people will promote a failed person. Right. Bobia has failed. He's filled so woefully. He's moved away from his economic uh, laurels or economic understanding of the economy of Ghana. And now thinks that he is more comfortable with digitalization. With, with ICT. <laughs> uh, so he's abandoned his uh, preferred field of study. He's now in ICT. That's his new baby. Yeah, uh, he so disappointed his wife to the extent that the wife can no longer say that he has the combined brains of the World Bank and the IMF. Mm. And uh, Baganias have now gotten to know. Try and try me and see. Should not be 
the reason why, the reason why we should elect a person into government, because that could be disastrous. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Yunusa Fuseni. Our time is up, but I'll read a few messages before we go. Uh, Saba K. Jim says, clearly, if you listen to Baumier's comments about the GRA last uh, time, it's clear. It clearly means that he was not in charge of the economy. Uh, rather, it was the former finance minister of Uyata who was in charge from James K. Saba. Thank you for your message. Uh, good morning. Bless. Continue your good works. Great piece of education from the venerable lawyer and former MP. My regards to uh, the mentor of the masses, Honorable Yunusa Fuseni, incoming Speaker of Parliament. Hey, Honorable, you have um... <laughs> somebody, somebody <laughs> <give> me... <laughs> you got, Oh, but you know, personally, from where I sit, yeah. I think you'd make a good Speaker of Parliament. Really? S sincerely, I think you right. would. Yeah, you are wishing you were. <laughs> <laughs> your, understanding, your, your understanding of the parliamentary standings and your legal background and everything, I think it makes you a good fit. I don't know what the future brings, but I won't be surprised. I'll be the least surprised person to see you in, in that in that uh, position. Now, ask number three. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I'll do a few more. Good morning. The best way to render the Supreme Court redundant is to vote massively for the NDC and push the super incompetent, arrogant MPP into the bush. Ben Osei from Asaman Kese. Thank you, Ben, for your message. Um, may I ask this question? Is Baumia still the vice president of the ruling MPP? Is he still part of Ikufuado's presidency? Please advise him to put a stop to the promises. We are fed up of those promises. Thank you. Thank you for your message. And uh, uh, Maurice Cerulo says, Bless. Is the court of the land also a puppet of the Nana People's Party? Uh, okay. Um, thank you very much for your message i think i've read some i think i've read this one already uh but this one here says my name is Degbe john kujo good morning to be honest with you voting for baumia is like signing your death warrant because when he becomes a president all that is promising he will not fulfill them don't we know baumia for now what he can do come on let's be serious in this country franklin nati says good good morning honorable fuseni um all right. Honorable Fuseni has heard you and response as well. <laughs> um, Morris, I think I've already done this one. And that's all for uh, today's edition of the show. I want to thank Honorable Inusa Fuseni. It's been largely a one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> it's, it's been largely a one-on-one -on -one interview, but um, I think we all have received lots of education with regards to this court issue and the standoff between the executive and the legislative arms of government. And uh, uh, we'll see what the future brings with regards to parliament. But thanks to our viewers, our cherished viewers at home, for always keeping a lot here on Pan African Television. We are extremely grateful. The morning show comes your way again tomorrow, uh, to, uh, Friday, the Friday edition. Then at Mona, Alaji B. Fuseni will be here to have conversations in relation to Africa and Ghana. Thank you. Do have a pleasant day. Bye bye.